Stay all day, Doc. You are now tuned into the show where you learn the discipline to show up day after day to do the work, the confidence to put yourself out there boldly and authentically, and the mental toughness to continue showing up, doing the work, putting yourself out there, even when the success you've expected to achieve has yet to be achieved. And on top of all this, you get a huge dose of personal initiative. That is the go-getter energy that moves any one of us, including yourself, to go and make things happen instead of waiting for things to happen. And then we put all this together into a series of frameworks, approaches, insights, strategies, and techniques all underneath the umbrella of one unifying philosophy that is called work on your game. My name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, and welcome to the show. And today's topic, we're going to talk about how to be critical, how to offer a critique to a person or offer something that someone may take as a critical uh, comment or statement without being cutting, without cutting that person down. We'll get into where this came from and exactly how to do it, as I already told you I would in a minute. But before we do that, let me tell everyone I have a daily motivation text message I send out free of charge to everyone who's in my text community. This is a message that's guaranteed to keep you focused, sharp, and on point. If you want to receive that message, here's what you do. Text me at my number, which is 305-384-6894. And every day when I send out the daily motivation, you will get this message straight to your phone, free of charge. And bonuses, you can even respond to those text messages. You might get a response back from me because every day I go through my messages and respond to people who have sent me texts. Second thing is, if you have not yet claimed your free copy of my book called The Third Day, The Decision That Separates the Pros from the Amateurs, I'll give you a free copy of the book. I just need you to go to thirddaybook.com and tell me where to send your book. Again, it's at thirddaybook.com and I will send you a copy of that book. And the third thing is, if you are interested in making more money in your business, I have a five-step system that will help you do it strategically in 90 days or less. All you have to do is go to workonyourgame.net the training is completely free. Just set aside 45 minutes to watch the training. Again, it's at workonyourgame.net. Now, getting into the topic here today, I thought of this subject because I was talking to a business colleague of mine who this person has a style that some people could bristle at, even though the person, this colleague of mine, is not trying to be that type of individual. They're not trying to be cutting. They're not trying to be um, nasty or negative or anything like that. And But, rather... At the same time, sometimes they say things in such a way that I could easily see. They actually brought this up when they were they were saying something to me, and then I responded in a uh, benign way. I wasn't bothered by what they had said or how they had said it. But they responded and said, well, I appreciate the fact that I could say what I said to you and you didn't have a problem with it. And because they brought that up, I said to them, well, hey, since you brought it up, understand that the way that you say things People could take offense to it, even though you're not trying to be offensive. So this is how, has, if any of you has ever been in a situation where you said something to somebody and you were not trying to be offensive, you were not trying to be negative, you weren't even trying to be critical, you were just stating something that you felt was obvious and clear and just needed to be said, but that person took offense to what you said. Has any of you ever had that happen? And then you're looking at that person like they're looking at you like you're trying to be hurtful and you're looking at them like what the hell are you talking about i didn't even do anything now there are other times though when you may be intentionally trying to offend sometimes i say things on this show that i know somebody may be offended by but i'm doing it on purpose but many times people are doing it unintentionally you're not even trying to be offensive but somebody lets you know that what you said or how you said it was offensive so if any of you have ever had that issue and you've been perplexed by why people are offended by something that you weren't even trying to be offensive with, today we're going to talk about those unintentional uh, offenses that you have committed and how to possibly fix them and just some slight changes you can make in your style of communication such that the people who you're communicating with couldn't possibly be offended by what you're saying. This is all a structure and is really like a communication system issue. And I'm gonna help you with the structure of your communication and the structure of how you communicate such that if you're not trying to be offensive, people won't take offense. Now, if you're trying to be offensive on purpose, then do as you wish. But if you're not trying to be offensive, but you have found that people have taken offense anyway to you, then let's fix that. All right, let's fix the structure and organization of your communication so that doesn't happen by accident, only on purpose. <laughs> Point number one, today's topic once again is how to be critical without being cutting. Number one thing that you must start doing, insert this into your normal uh, style of communication. Here's what you do, two words, ask permission. That's all I need you to start doing. When you are communicating with other people, simply ask permission. Ask permission for what, Dre? 
Well, keep this in mind. People hate, all people, hate, hate, H-A-T-E, hate to receive unsolicited advice, especially when that unsolicited advice is critical unsolicited advice. So what some of you call constructive criticism, understand that constructive criticism is only well received when it is welcomed and asked for, or you, they, it has been given permission to be given. In other words, if you come to me and just start offering me a constructive criticism that I didn't ask you for, there's a good chance that I will completely reject you and what you said. Not because what you said is wrong, but simply because I didn't ask you for your opinion. But if you come to me and ask me, hey, may I offer you some constructive criticism? And I say yes, now I've given you permission. Now you can tell me what you want to tell me. But if you just come up to me and just give it to me without asking me, it's a good chance I'm going to reject it. Now, I'm just using myself here just to frame the point. I'm a type of person who can take constructive criticism probably more than most. I come from a background of being an athlete and I'm a type of person who can, I'm thick skinned enough, my mind is strong enough to take those kind of things from the right type of people. However, most people don't want to hear constructive criticism, period, unless, especially unless they have given you explicit permission to give it to them. So what you're going to start doing is two words, ask permission. Do not offer unsolicited advice to a person, especially when it's critical if they haven't given you permission to give it to them. I don't care how right you think you are. Don't give it to them if they didn't ask for it. Even if you think you are completely accurate, even if you think what you would offer them would help them immensely. Listen, I've talked to a lot of people who, I remember, I know sometimes that I'm talking to a person and I'm thinking to myself, I wish this person would just ask me for some advice because I could tell them a lot of things that would help them out, but they never asked me. Therefore, I keep my mouth shut. I keep my opinions to myself. I keep my constructive criticism to myself. Why? Because he didn't ask me for it. Sometimes I go on people's, I do a lot of appearances on other people's platforms, other people's like podcasts and shows and things like that. And sometimes I see the way people are running their shows or the way that, uh, the way that people just run the operations of setting up the interviews or the way that somebody asks questions or the way that some people have certain verbal tics in their conversation. And I say to myself, damn, if this person would just ask me, hey, Dre, what do you think I can do to make my stuff better? If they would just ask me, I would tell them I could help them out a lot. But they never asked me, so I don't say anything. I just keep my opinions to myself and let them go on doing however they want to do things. Why? Because that that takes a takes a certain level of discipline and maturity, you on your part, when you know you got something that you think could help another person, but not give it to them because they didn't ask you for it. This is just the way that it works. Now, if you really, really, really feel like you need to give it to somebody, you can ask them. Again, like I just said, initiate it by asking them. Say, okay, if I give you some advice, then give it to them. Ideally, you want people coming to you asking you to give them advice. Then you give them everything. But if you have to go to somebody and say, hey, can I offer you something? And out of the blue, uh, usually they don't want to hear it, even though they may be polite and say yes. So, for example, going back to the example that led to this episode, when I was talking to this business colleague of mine, I, and friend as well, but this, we were talking about a business subject when this conversation happened. I specifically used this tactic with this person because they had said to me, hey, I appreciate that I can say you know, the things that I say to you without you taking offense to it. And I responded to them and said, hey, is it since you brought that up, is it OK if I offered you some feedback about your style of communication? Because while it didn't bother me, I understand how your style of communication can bother a person. I asked them, I said it just like that. And they replied and said, yes, you can give me that, because actually I've been thinking about that. So please tell me what you got. And then I gave them what I had to give them. But you see how I set that up? I set myself up for success there instead of just responding to them and saying, hey, let me tell you something about the way you talk to people. That, that wouldn't have worked. <laughs> but since they asked for it, I was willing, I was able to give it to them and they were open to hearing it. Okay, so they gave me permission and then I gave them feedback. So usually when you ask someone if it's okay for you to offer const constructive criticism, they usually say yes, 99, 99 times out of 100. So you might be asking yourself, well, why even ask? Why even ask if they're always going to say yes? You ask because when someone gives you permission to offer them criticism, now they have no grounds upon which to push back or be angry at the fact that you gave them criticism because they just gave you permission to do it. Now, if you just offer someone criticism and you don't ask, now they got a reason to be mad at you because they're like, well, who the hell asked you what your opinion was of me? They didn't, nobody. The answer is nobody, so you shouldn't have said it. So when it's like if, you're, if somebody's working for me, for example, I ask them, hey, is it okay for me, Mr. or Mrs. Staff Member, to point it out every time? If you make a mistake, is it okay for me to point it out and let you know that you made a mistake and so we can fix it? 
Now, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that they're going to say, yes, of course, point it out. I mean, you're the boss. Of course, you should point out that I made a mistake. So now, every time that I point out that they made a mistake, they won't be mad at me. They won't think I'm being negative. They won't think I'm attacking them. Because why? They gave me permission to point out their mistakes. And that's why I asked them, is it okay if I do this? Now, this might seem like a very simple and not even a necessary thing, but it makes a huge difference. Even when you're the person who's in a position where you don't need to ask anybody permission. Like if somebody's working for me, I don't need to ask them permission to offer them feedback, do I? I mean, you, you're working for me. I, I can give you feedback whenever I want to. Ideal, I mean, not ideally, but uh, factually, logically, I can give you feedback whenever I feel like it. But when I ask the person, when I ask someone who's working for me, is it okay if I offer you feedback and offer you constructive criticism anytime I notice that something needs to be said? What I'm doing is I'm allowing that other person to feel as if they have some power and agency over the situation. And the reason why that matters, even though it's, it's window dressing, I'll be honest, that's what it is, window dressing. The reason it matters, though, is because people are much more receptive to receiving something that could possibly make them uncomfortable when they feel like they have power over receiving it versus when they don't feel like they have power over receiving it. So when someone says, yes, you can give me feedback, now they are more willing to listen to what I'm going to say, as opposed to if you just throw it on them, throw it in their lap and never ask them. It's like if you have a child and you want, their child, you want your child to clean up their room, you could say, hey, go clean your room. You could do that and they probably have to listen to you for you no know, to avoid a penalty or you could or you could say hey do you want to make your bed first or you do want to pick up your toys first which one you want to do first make your bed or pick up your toys now notice that either way you're getting what you want because your child is going to start cleaning their room because all you all you do is put them in a double bind no matter which one they pick they're doing what you want them to do but what have you done you've given them the appearance of having some power in the process you've given them agency over their choices while at the same time you're fully in control this is a critical soft skill and you might think that's too simple of an example because i'm talking about using it on a child and you might think that doesn't work on adults on the contrary it works on adults all right go try it and find out so the number one thing ask permission point number two today's topic once again is how to be critical without being cutting number two observations and questions over accusations and assumptions this one right here is huge this one right here will help avoid a whole lot of conflicts and a whole lot of arguments and a whole lot of hurt feelings. Observations and questions over accusations and assumptions. See, the thing is, when human beings feel upset, annoyed, frustrated, angry, tired, you know, uh, low on willpower, what we usually do, and we're dealing with other people, what we usually do is we get into levying accusations based on our assumptions. And when you accuse another person of something, or you make a statement towards a person that is based on an assumption that may or may not be accurate, usually what happens is you put another person on the defensive, where now they feel like they have to defend themselves. If I come to you and accuse you of something, now you're gonna defend yourself. Because that's what people do. When you, when you get accused, all right, what happens in a court of law? If someone's being accused of something, what do they gotta do? They gotta go to court and defend themselves. They gotta get a defense attorney. You are the defense, they're the prosecution. You got to defend yourself. When you accuse a person, they go defensive, always. This is natural human reaction. And when you make a statement towards a person or ask a question or do anything based on an assumption, especially when your assumption is wrong that you may later find out, now you start an argument. Because if you make a statement towards someone based on an assumption and your assumption is wrong, now that person is defending themselves, you are assuming that you're right, they know that you're wrong, and now what do you have? You have a conflict. And let's say you, it, you find out later on that you were wrong and that they were right, it is very difficult for a human being to admit that they were wrong, especially when they presented themselves as being fully confident in being right. This is something that very few adults are capable of doing. Coming back later on, a day later, a week later, an hour later, and admitting, you know what? I'm sorry about that. I made a false assumption. I was wrong. I apologize. How often have you had an adult say that to you? I mean, think about that. How often have you had someone make an assumption about you, you knew that they were wrong, you argued them down to try to help them understand that they were wrong, and then they later on came back and said, you know what, I was wrong, you were right, I'm sorry about that, I apologize. How often has that happened as opposed to someone making an assumption about you, being wrong, you argued them down to help them understand that they were wrong, and they just went on coming up with more and more rationalizations to 
basically justify their wrongs. Like, instead of just admitting that they were wrong, just, uh, just coming up with some reason to make themselves feel justified in their bullshit. How many of you ever had that happen? Exactly. So when I'm dealing with someone and I feel like they are making a mistake, it is usually not in my best interest and is not in the best interest of productivity and performance, which is the game that we're in, folks. It's not in my best interest to accuse them of messing up, even if they are messing up. And it's not in my best interest to make assumptions about why they are messing up, even though they're messing up. So you may be thinking to yourself, okay, Dre, well, what should I do since they are messing up and you want them to stop messing up? Here's what you should do. And this is what is much easier for you and them. And it will lead to much smoother communications. Instead, here's what you do. You point out an observation about what's happening rather than an accusation, an observation. This is a key distinction, everybody. Observation and ask a question rather than making an accusation and rather than making an assumption. So instead of accusing a person and saying, yo, you're making a mistake, instead point out an observation and say, I'm noticing this. Instead of accusing them or making an assumption and saying, okay, you're messing up because that's me assuming why they're messing up when I don't know. Instead, ask a question and say, well, I noticed this. Let me ask you something. Do you notice the difference? Could you notice how you will be more open to the observation question technique rather than the accusation assumption technique? So if I make an accusation assumption, I'll say something like you keep messing up because you're not paying attention. Now, how are you going to respond to that? That's a fight or flight. I'm, I'm triggering your fight or flight by saying that. All right, I'm putting you in a position where either you have to accept what I just said, which makes you wrong by default, or you got to fight back against me, which leads to confrontation. But if instead I say, well, look, I noticed that this thing is not being done right. Let me ask you, did you notice the exact same thing? Now, I started a dialogue. Nobody's on defense. Nobody's feeling confronted. Nobody feels attacked. But we still, assert, we still get to the same outcome, which is fixing the issue. Now, remember that we're in a performance-based business. This is not about necessarily protecting another person's feelings. I am, but at the same time, we're about getting the performance done. And if I attack another person to where their feelings feel hurt and they feel like they're being attacked and they feel like they're on their heels and they got to be defensive, is that going to help them perform at a high level? And if they're on my team, it's not, and that's going to hurt me. So you understand what I'm saying here is that, yes, this, this can help you protect another person's feelings, but not necessarily because that's the number one objective. It's part of the objective to the bigger picture, which is helping everybody on the team perform at a higher level. So you have to understand, all right, what are you trying to do here? What's the goal here? What are we trying to achieve? And you also got to be able to read the room. You got to know who you're dealing with. What type of people are you dealing with and how do they need to be talked to? Because not everybody needs to be addressed the same way. So it's usually not in the best interest of productivity to accuse somebody of messing up or making assumptions about why. So what you do again, observe, question, rather than accuse, assume. So if somebody's working for me and they keep missing a specific detail that I have already gone over with them and already explained to them, but they still mess it up. It looks to me like this person is being careless and not paying attention to detail. What is that? That's an assumption. I don't want to make assumptions. Even if I'm thinking it, I'm not going to say that. Here's what I'm going to do. Because if I said that to them, then what I'm doing is accusing them and assuming. That puts them on the defensive. Even if I'm right, I'm putting them on the defensive. I don't want them on the defensive because I need them at, at their best. And people usually aren't playing their best game when they're on the defensive. Even if I'm correct. Again, sometimes being right isn't what you want. Sometimes you need to very, more importantly, be accurate. And sometimes being accurate means addressing the way that you say things to people because it helps achieve the outcome. Accuracy is about achieving the desired outcome. It's not about proving yourself correct. Everybody keep that distinction in mind at all times. So me assuming and accusing, is that going to help that person perform better? Absolutely not. So here's what I do instead. I say to them, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Person, I noticed that this detail was missing the last three times you completed this task. So looking at the documentation and how I showed you how to do this job, this detail, I showed you that this detail was important, but this detail still is not being addressed. So let me ask you, have you noticed the same thing that I have noticed? Question mark. Now, I want you to notice what I did there. I put that, I put that person in a position to tell on themselves and take ownership of the situation. See, notice that I'm not coming at them and telling them what they did. I'm pointing it out, 
but I'm putting them in a position to own it. Rather than me telling them and throwing ownership in their lap, I'm letting them take ownership from me. I say, do you notice the same thing that I notice? And if they say yes, oh, you know what? Damn, I didn't even I, I didn't even notice it, but I notice it now. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, I didn't mess that up. Sorry, my bad. Let me go back and fix that. Usually, if you have good people around you, they will do something like that. They'll take ownership of it when they notice it. Or maybe they are looking at it differently from how you're looking at it. And they'll say, oh, well, I didn't do it that way because, and then they'll explain their perspective. So see, you wouldn't know their perspective. You came at them with an assumption and they may never even tell you their perspective. You came with an assumption because now you put them on a defensive. But if you open them up by asking a question, now you allow them space to explain themselves. Because maybe they're just looking at things differently from how you're looking at them. But if you don't open up the lines of communication with the right question and the right approach, then you shut them down. And now you can't get anything done. And remember what the point of accuracy is, which is achieving the outcome. So you put that person in a position to do that. So either way, folks, we end up in the same place. But I have allowed this person to save face, which means they feel more confident in themselves. They don't feel like they've been beat down or slapped upside the head with the truth. And I did it in a diplomatic way. We still got to the truth. I just did it in a diplomatic way. This matters. The reason it matters because especially it especially matters when you're dealing with a person who you need to keep dealing with. Now, if you're dealing with someone who you only got to deal with one time and you don't mind burning the bridges with that person, all right, do it whatever way you want to based on your assumptions. But in my people skills course, I talk about, and this is available in Work On Your Game University, it will help you with all of this stuff in even more detail. How to deal with people on a level that allows you and them to save face and you to maintain a a productive working relationship which I'm guessing most of you want with anybody that you're dealing with point number three today's topic once again is how to be critical without being cutting number three ownership over blame and these are two different things you now I talk in the 12 working your game commandments episode 2219 that one of the one of the commandments is taking full ownership taking ownership over your situation even if it's not your fault it is your responsibility that's ownership and sometimes when I explain the concept of ownership to people, some people get defensive. And the first thing they say is, oh, what does that mean? I'm the blame for my situation. But if you want to look at it like that, then, yeah, we can say yes. But the whole point of taking ownership means you are taking responsibility for a situation, even if it's not your fault. Now, you notice there's a difference between fault and ownership. But ownership means responsibility. This means I have the ability to respond to this situation, even though you, you and you are the reason for this situation. I'm going to respond to it. That's what responsibility means. See, this here is a great tactic for getting someone to assume responsibility over a situation by first. Here's what you do. You take it into your hands and you present them the opportunity to take it off of your hands and put it in their hands. So let's take that exact same situation. I'll tell you how you do this. Where someone on my staff is not paying attention to detail and they keep missing something that they should not be missing. I'll say to them, hey, uh, Mr. X, I noticed that this detail is missing in this situation. So there must be something that I did not properly explain to you about how to do this because this detail should not be being missed. So I must not have explained this properly. So let me ask you, Mr. X, tell me what you understand about how to do this task. That way I can figure out where I may have messed up in my communication and in my explanation because whatever you're doing is not coming out the way that I envisioned it. So I must not have explained this the right way. So tell me what you know about it so I can figure out where I messed up. Close quote. See what I did there? I took all ownership of the situation. All right, they're messing up. And I know that they're messing up because I know I explained this the right way, but I'm not gonna blame them for messing up. I'm gonna take ownership. I'm gonna take responsibility. So what I'm gonna do is say, all right, I must've messed up because you're not doing this right and I know I explained it right. So tell me what I explained to you. Repeat back to me what I already told you so I can see where the holes are in my communication skill. Now, when they go and explain it back to me, in that process, if I did indeed explain it well, they're going to come over that detail that they're clearly missing and they're going to cast themselves and say, oh, shit, damn, Dre, you know what? You're right. I am missing that detail. Let me fix that. My bad. Thanks for bringing that up to me. And you see how everybody save face. We're going to get to the outcome still and everybody's in a good space. Ownership over blame. Instead of just going to them and saying, yo, mofo, you keep messing up. What are you doing? What's your problem? I could go to them like that. I would be right. I would be accurate. It would be within my rights but it's gonna help us perform. Remember what the goal is. So when they explain it to me, if I've done my job properly and included that detail, they will be able to point it out on their own and take ownership. The other option would be if I just came at them and smacked them in the face by blaming them, as I just gave you that example. I could do that, 
but it would not help us produce high performance. So that would be an inaccurate formula. Even though I'm right, I'm not accurate. I'm pausing there. I want to make sure I'm not going too fast for y'all to catch everything that I'm saying. Everybody understand the difference. Point number four. Today's topic, once again, is how to be critical without being cutting. Number four. See, the biggest thing in communication skills is not if you have the right idea and is not even if you have accurate information. What it's really about is how you choose to put your words together. That's the biggest thing in communication. How do you put your words together? You can get the same point across to someone in 10 different ways, depending on how you decide to say it. Good leaders are strong communicators and are deft at taking ownership and responsibility for situations, even when they know they're not the ones responsible for it. But they do it in an artful, such artful type of way that allows other people to take responsibility back, back into their own hands. It's just in the, your style of communication. So if I take ownership and say, hey, uh, Mr. or Mrs. X, this is not being done right, but I think I must not have explained it to you properly. Tell me what, how you understand this job is supposed to be done. And as they do that, they'll realize that they are missing the detail that they haven't been paying attention to. They've been sleeping at the wheel. They'll take the ownership back from me that I just put on myself. If you got good people around you, they will always look to do this. Sometimes you just got to remind people. But you do it in such a way that the people with whom you communicate will notice that you're doing it. And then they will take responsibility back in their own hands and they'll appreciate you for not but pulling their pants down in public, metaphorically speaking, because you pointed things out in a diplomatic way. So if you smack people in the face with the truth or when you do, you're not wrong, but you may be inaccurate because the goal of accuracy, again, is achieving outcomes consistently. That's the goal of accuracy. The goal of accuracy is not to prove yourself right. Those are two different things. Smacking people in the face with the truth usually causes them to lose face. So again, if you are okay with losing your relationship with another person or losing their productivity, go ahead, smack them in the face with the truth all you want. But if you, if you want to lose face, have them lose face, lose trust in you and lose confidence in themselves, go ahead and smack people upside the head with the truth. Now, if you know you're dealing with someone who is tough enough to take it, then maybe you can get away with that. But if you do it with the wrong person, you might lose that person. You might lose their trust in you, their confidence in you, their belief in you because of the way that you approach the situation, not because of the situation itself, just the way that you approached it. Now you, and this show is directed towards the leaders. Now you need to know better and you need to, because you know better, you need to do better. And remember what our goal is, long-term performance and results, not proving ourselves right. All said, let's recap today's class, which says how to be critical without being cutting. Thought of the subjects, I was talking to a business colleague of mine who said something that, well, they said something to me, then they said, well, I appreciate it. I can share things with you without you taking offense because other people can sometimes take offense. And I said, well, since you brought that up, well, the way that you say things, people can take offense. And it made me think of things I'm gonna share here today that I think all of you can learn from. Point number one, ask permission. Remember that people hate to hear unsolicited advice, especially when it is critical. So do not do this. If you really wanna offer some, someone something that they could take as critical, Ask them permission. That way they can never be mad about the fact that you criticize them because you, they gave you permission to do so. Point number two, observations and questions over accusations and assumptions. Point out that you notice something and ask open-ended questions so that other people can talk rather than accusing them of doing something and making assumptions about why they are doing it. Even though you, again, you can be accurate, but you can be right, excuse me, but still not be accurate. So just open the space up to give people time and space to speak for themselves. And they will usually, if you have good people around you, they will take ownership because you're giving them space to do so rather than forcing it upon them. Point number three, ownership over blame. This is where you take ownership over a situation and ask, where did you mess up that is causing the other person to mess up? And this is an indirect way of giving them an opportunity to take ownership over the situation. And again, if you are a good judge of character and you have good people around you, they will take that ownership back from you. You won't have to force them to do it. If they're not taking it back from you, then maybe you made a bad decision in choosing your people. Number four, the biggest thing in communication skills is not if you're right and it's not even being accurate. It's a matter of how you choose to put your words together and how you choose to deliver your message to other people. You have to be good leaders, are strong communicators, and we're good at really taking ownership and responsibility for situations, even when we know that someone else is responsible for it. So you got to really just work on how you're putting words together and how you decide to say things, keeping in mind that the goal of accuracy is long-term results. The goal is not proving yourself right or another person proving themselves right or anybody proving another person wrong, because again, that's all about 
egos. And when you're putting your ego out in front, you're usually not putting the success of the team in front of that. So let's keep in mind what the big goal is here and why we are even playing this game in the first place. All that said, text me to get my daily motivation for free straight to your phone every day. My number is 305-384-6894. And if you're interested in making more money in your business, you want a five-step system to do it in 90 days or less, go to workonyourgame.net. The training is free. Again, that's workonyourgame.net. Work on your game. Dre all day.